nothing but the truth. Well, I'm not going to surrender my Ram to the BJP. I don't think BJP has a copyright on Lord Ram. Uh, he is as much mine as he is Mr. Modi's. But I will go on a non-political occasion as a worshipper. I go to temples to pray. I don't go to temples to perform politics. They all make this mad, uh, very obvious and shameless kind of a competition to get the Muslim vote. And for that, they will say or do anything. And even uh, many Muslims that I have met are embarrassed by this uh, show of brazen appeasement that um, is really cringeworthy, uh, according to me. Forms has two meanings in English. The other meaning is acting, theatre, performance. That's what the BJP is all about. It's all about performing. Performing for the cameras of the media, performing to the general public. The people's widespread acknowledgement of the fact that the last 15 years he has done very little. He has made a lot of big, big promises, including uh, a promise that he should have never made, but uh, he, ha he made that he would trans transform Tirundurum into Barcelona and uh, many, those, many of those kinds of promises that he obviously never intended to keep. There is a movie that has been extremely controversial called The Kerala Story. But I'm not here to talk to you about that. I'm talking to you about the Tiruvananthapuram story. Because this is the battle between Shashi Tharoor, the erudite Congress MP, three times from Tiruvananthapuram or Trivandrum, and Rajiv Chandrasekhar, the Minister of State for Electronics and Information Technology. And this is possibly the biggest, as mo the most vocal battle that is happening in election 2024. 20, uh, so in this episode of Nothing But The Truth, we will talk to both Shashi Tharoor as well as Rajiv Chandrasekhar as to what are the key issues, what do they think are the, their uh, chances in this election, and what will determine the outcome. So let's begin by talking to Shashi Tharoor on the campaign trail. We've had, we stopped by for a wayside coffee. Let's uh, listen to what he says. Sitting in a cafe with Shashi Tharoor, the three-time MP, and he's just back from uh, on the campaign trail where he sat up, uh, up uh, what, what can I call it, Shashi, a buggy or some sort? <laughs> no, no, it's a, it's a pickup truck, but with a modification that gives me a chair uh, and enough space for a couple of colleagues to stand so we can wave at the public and the voters as we go by. Well, it's quite, a, quite impressive uh, to you. see you, you like going it. around the town with uh, everybody waving. But uh, Shashi, you are now almost a veteran, three times MP. How different is this battle that you see? Well, there was a transition between my first election in 2009 and my fourth election. Now, 2009, I took the seat from the communists who had won the two previous elections. Um, and, um, and they still came second in 2009. But in 14 and 19, the BJP has emerged as the clear alternative. In fact, they are clearly the strongest. I mean, Thiruvanthapuram is clearly their strongest constituency in Kerala. I don't see them uh, faring as well in any other constituency as they have managed to fare here for a number of demographic and other reasons they have a, a bit more of a base here than anywhere else so i would say today it's much more a fight between me and the bjp with the ldf almost certainly uh, certainly by all the assessments of your colleagues in the media who come and catch me all the time they're all assessing the ldf way behind in third place were well, you a bit disappointed that uh you know, the India Alliance, which, has, which is also partnering with the communist parties uh, in various other places, but in Kerala they are fighting alone, I mean, you have no tie-ups. Is that going to be an issue? Not at all. I've often argued, uh, I mean, not just as a politician, mm -hmm. but as a, an observer and commentator on Indian politics, uh -huh. that our elections are also simultaneously 29 different state elections. Right. And the truth is that uh, our political culture in each state varies enormously. Right. So the LDF led by the communists and the UDF led by the Congress have been two completely polar opposites in the state for 55 years. The idea of they're actually cooperating is, is unthinkable in Kerala, whereas right next door in Tamil Nadu, the communists, the CPI, CPM, Congress, our ally, the Indian Union Muslim League, and the DMK are all together. There's no issues at all, and we are allies even in this election. Just next door, the states literally across the border. So when you look at that, you realize that the only way the India alliance was going to come together from the very start was on a state-by-state -state basis. And to my mind, that's why there's no problem with the fact that uh, Aam Aadmi Party is with us in Delhi, in Gujarat, and three, four other places, but is not with us in Punjab. Because each state has its own political realities, its own political calculations, and one could argue its own political history. 
And that's the specialty about India. It's a reminder to Mr. Modi and Mr. Shah and their friends that we are a federal country. We are a very diverse country. And that diversity is something that we value in most of these states that we want to preserve. Rather than go for this, you know, one nation, one party, one leader, one election kind of message that the BJP wants to give all the time. Isn't that a bit of a contradiction in some sense? If you look at it, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't give the public an image of uh, unity. Uh, it, it seems that, you you know, here you can see the contradiction. I was in Tamil Nadu, but here you can see the posters of your rival uh, from the Communist Party out there, and you are arguing against uh, the, the government over here. Doesn't that in some senses re re represent a certain division and therefore for the public confidence that the India, India is really not together, the India alliance is really not together, it's but, fragmented? But, no, but we are together. I think the problem is there are compulsions for all parties. Uh -huh. uh, as I say, because the quarrel in Congress, I'm sorry, in Kerala, is between Congress... <laughs> you probably have a quarrel in the Congress which you will want no, to talk no, about. No, no, no. <laughs> but the I think quarrel <laughs> in Kerala is between the Congress-led coalition and the Communist-led coalition. There's bound to be a clash in Kerala. But on some of the national issues that matter, secularism being a prime example, we are likely to find common ground. So what we saw in 2004 was particularly illustrative, where the communists clobbered the UDF. Uh, I wasn't in Indian <laughs> politics at the time, but I watched this with amazement, and won pretty much every seat, having 19 out of 20 or 18 out of 20, they won. But the moment they showed up in Delhi, it was to support the Manmohan Singh government that was being formed from the outside. Uh, so if they can do that in 2004, they can do the same again. But I don't think they're going to be clobbering us. There's a tremendous amount of anti-incumbency against the communist government. And that's going to mean that I think they're once again going to come a cropper. Also, the voters in Kerala understand the difference between an assembly election and a Lok Sabha election. And there will be places where the same voter will vote for, say, the communists for the assembly, but we'll have the intelligence and knowledge to know that at the national level, the communists are not a major enough factor. And if they want a strong voice against the BJP, they have to vote Congress. And the same voter can therefore go both ways in two different elections. You've seen this in my own constituency of seven assembly segments. Six have communist representatives. I just have one MLA from my party. But I've been winning um, uh, three times in a row and I'm expecting to win the fourth time. Now, if you take a look at some of the key issues that are there in this particular election as compared to the three others, what are the two or three big issues that you think we are battling on this election? So, Shashi, we were, I mean, uh, we're getting the light better, so we've turned around a bit. But uh, tell me, uh, what are the big, two or three big issues in this particular election as different from what you'd seen in two, 2019? Well, the first big issue is the, um, is the desire that's widely felt across the state for us to... Um, defenestrates the, the, Congre the BJP government in Delhi. Right. Because the fact is that we in Kerala have been appalled to see some of the things that have gone on in the course right. of the last 10 years. Um, and, and as far as I'm concerned, this is a state where we have 47% of the population belonging to the minorities, Muslims and Christians. And we have a BJP government seeking their votes after having done the horrors they've done to Muslims across northern India and to Christians uh, across many parts of the northeast and the north, the tribal belt in particular, and, um, and, mm -hmm. and recently in Manipur where 230 churches have been destroyed. Can we define this particular thing? Is it a clash of ideologies that you're talking about? Yep, absolutely. And what, are these, what is the big clash that you, you, you are talking so about? So the big clash, I mean, for example, when you were following me at the various junctions and speaking, I was talking about the fact that I stand for India's diversity and pluralism, for social harmony, and for a development that includes everyone, that takes everyone along in the name of progress. Whereas sadly, this is not what we have seen coming out of the BJP government for the last 10 years. And that's something that the people of our states fully realize. So I would say that that message is a very strong one because one of the things that I'm trying to explain to people is that an MP uh, is not somebody who can deliver direct results in the development front except through using influence, right. whether it's influence on the government of bureaucrats and so on, or influence on his international contacts and national contacts, such as with companies, such as the companies I brought into the Technopark, or um, uh, persuading Mr. Adani to bid for the Vuyenyam port and that sort of stuff. That's what an MP can do. What matters very much more is what stands is the MP taking in Parliament. What is the MP trying to stand for? What are the values? 
So I can make the voice of my people heard in Trivandrum, sorry, in Parliament, for the people of Trivandrum for Parliament, by, for example, I've spoken 20 times on various coastal erosion issues, which have been bedeviling my constituency. I, and I neither wanted to come to the Adani sure. point that you'd said, that you brought the Adani point. That's but just to finish the sentence, yeah. I can hear make their voice heard, but they also want to know the, who, what kind of values am I speaking up for, what kind of political stands have I taken on the issues that matter to people here. And so, for, the, for, for example, the fact that I took such a strong stand on the CAA when it came, I opposed the introduction of the bill, I spoke in the debate against the bill, I went to Shaheen Bagh and spoke to the, the grandmothers there. Uh, all of that is actually an important factor in this, in this election. That's one example of how the stands I've taken matter. There's also things I did, for example, when COVID happened. I, within 24 hours of the lockdown being announced, I used up all my remaining MP funds in getting the first ever set of RT-PCR kits to Kerala, to my constituency, as well as uh, 9,000 PPE gowns, ma masks and gloves right. that no doctors in any of the government hospitals had. So that kind of thing was even appreciated by the communist chief minister at that time. And that shows people that in crisis they've had an MP. Cyclone Oki hit. I was there on right. the spot trying to deal with it successfully. And those kinds of things will obviously count in mm -hmm. terms of my track record. Coming to your uh, arch uh, rival here, Rajiv Chandrasekhar, and uh, he sort of says this is non-performance versus... <laughs> <laughs> I know he keeps talking about the politics of 15 performance. 15 years of non-performance and the politics of performance. I mean, this is really <laughs> rather embarrassing. First of all, because he has no clue about my performance. And in fact, uh, there'll be many others who will tell him that I think my performance has exceeded those of any previous MP, and we've had some very famous and distinguished ones. But you know, don't forget when you talk about the politics of performance, performance has two meanings in English. The other meaning is acting, theatre, performance. That's what the BJP is all about. It's all about performing. Performing for the cameras of the media, performing to the general public, saying, hey, look, we've done this, we've done that. As I said, Kerala, there were three promises made by the BJP government specifically for Kerala. Um, all other things, the schemes they, they, that Mr. Chandrasekhar is pointing out in his, in his statements uh -huh. are sp schemes that apply to the whole of India. We are we're part of India, so they can't leave us out. But three specific problems were made for Kerala. One, that there would be an AIMS in Kerala. Still no sign of an AIMS. Two, that there would be a national There's institute. A brick or something of that AIMS somewhere? <laughs> not even a brick. Not even a site. Not even a choice of site. Nothing. Right. And no budget. Second, National Institute of Ayurveda, which was my request and which the Irish minister proclaimed here in Trivandrum would be done. They went back and did it in Gujarat, not in Kerala. Third promise, in their budget speech of 2015, 2016, under the actual budget, there is a promise to upgrade the National Institute of Speech and Hearing, which is in my constituency, into a National University for Disability Studies. They broke that promise too, because they put the National University in the Northeast. Result, only three promises made in the entire 10 years of BJP rule to Kerala, None of those three promises kept, all of them broken. Why should anybody believe any promises by a BJP candidate when their track record is zero, their batting average is zero? Yesterday, uh, or a couple of days back, apparently Raju Chandrasekhar at a public meeting said, uh, you know, Shashi who reads so many books and he comes up every time with new words of, in, in English. I don't really have the time to uh, do books. I actually uh, do work. And he kind of hinted that you were more pedagogical or ideological, <laughs> I mean, in terms of uh, this thing. As I said, uh, I have a 66-page progress report in Malayalam, which is 68 pages in English, that actually lays out in great detail all the things I've done, including the highway bypass we talked about, the Wayne Port. I brought the UAE consulate using my influence to the foreign minister of the UAE. There was no consulate even though Keralites are the largest single ethnic group. Going to the UAE, they had to apply in other cities of India. I got the UAE consulate here. I'm proud to say that my efforts in everything, small and big for the people of my constituency, whether it's bringing major companies like Oracle and Nissan and so on to the Technopark, all the way down to, to, um, to dealing with some individual family that has had a son in trouble abroad or whatever, I've done all this and so there are enough people in Trivandrum over the last 15 years who know that the BJP candidate is talking through his hat, that there is absolutely no doubt at all that I have performed. But, but coming to the uh, nitty-gritty of the campaign itself, one of the issues is that apparently the 
uh, Muslims uh, seem to be a little divided about their support. Now, are you confident of getting the Muslim support over here, as I, well I, as your own community, which again, since Raju Chandrasekhar also represents a certain part of that Hindu community, that that is going to be split? Yeah. So, as far as I'm concerned, I, my stands are taken on principle. So, when I was invited to uh, inaugurate the Muslim League rally, 15 days after the war started in Gaza, um, I spoke very strongly uh, about Israel's violations of international humanitarian law, bombing a church and other things like hospitals and so on. And I also spoke about the Geneva Conventions and how they were not being observed. And I, and I spoke with some conviction, because and that knowledge, of India's stand on all these matters. I'd also had the privilege of interacting with Yasser Arafat at least half a dozen times in my UN career. And, and so I could speak um, from direct recollection of his regard for India and Mrs. Gandhi, uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, whom he regarded as an elder sister, and so on. So that was the thrust of my speech. But I had one sentence that got some uh, Muslims upset, because I said, on October 7th, terrorists killed 1,200 innocent Israeli civilians, women and children included, and took 250 hostages. That one sentence, I didn't mention any organization, didn't name anything else, is what led to this entire communist-inspired campaign against me, that I'm pro-Israel and, and, and that I've denounced Hamas as terrorists. I have not. In fact, I was asked by an international interviewer, do you consider Hamas a terrorist organization? I said, I have no right to make that determination. Only the government of India can do it. And to this day, neither the Congress government nor the BJP government has declared Hamas to be on the list of terrorist organizations. Therefore, that term is not one that I would apply. I would simply say that the act of whoever did October 7th, and some people, as you know, don't call it Hamas, they think it's Islamic Jihad. Whatever it may be, whoever did it, that was an act of terrorism. And I'm very un unambiguous about that. But my standing with the victims of the, of the, of the war, whether they're Israeli, whether they're Arab, and 1,200 Israelis versus now something close to 40,000 Palestinians who have died in this war, it's extremely, extremely difficult for the country of Mahatma Gandhi not to make some judgments in favor of peace, and I've stood for that throughout. And the division in your own community, you don't see Hindutva capturing Kerala? No, BJP has always um, had a certain appeal to a certain small segment mm -hmm. uh, of society in Kerala. Don't forget that the largest number of RSS shakhas per head of population anywhere in India is actually in Kerala, which surprises people because we're known to be a secular, secular state, but this is true. Having said that, the BJP over the years since independence has grown from about a 2%. I mean, I say BJP, I include the whole lot, Jansang, Hindu Mahasabha, whatever, Hindu Munani was another uh, uh, group here. They've grown from a 2-3% lot to a 12-13% lot. But for the last three elections or so, they have remained stuck at that ceiling of 12-13%, uh, because that is about the extent uh, of people who are prepared either to vote for a communal agenda or to condone a communal agenda in the name of whatever else they might want to attribute to the BJP. 12-13% doesn't get you anything. So therefore, they have been trying to appeal beyond that 12-13% to a non-communal minded section of the population and one, one particular appeal they're reaching out to is the Christian community. And had it not been for Manipur and then the attacks on Christian churches and worshippers during Christmas week last year as well, if it weren't for that, it might have had some appeal uh, to some sections of the Christian community who were perhaps favored, who felt that, the, that others were being favored or whatever. But right now, the pulse of the Christian community is certainly not in favor, overwhelmingly not in favor of the BJP. And the Muslims, of course, will see absolutely no way that they can consider and The more. Hindus in terms of the Nayas the and Hindus, the the, Hindu, that, that, the Hindus that. will always be divided amongst all three parties. Mm -hmm. There have been some Hindu prominent leaders in, uh, in, in each of the elections. And I always point out to people, look, I need everyone. My election victories have never been based on any one community at all. They've always had to be a coalition of voters who see my qualities, my personal qualities, as well as the values and principles of my party and, and what I stand for and I've spoken for. And those are the ones who have, to help, who have helped me win. And that includes, I mean, it can't just be Muslims because Trivandrum is barely 10% Muslim. It can't just be Christians, because Christians are about 19, 20%. Trivandrum is still overwhelmingly a Hindu city. It's about 68% Hindu. And in that, there is certainly 
an ideological affinity for the left among some people, an ideological affinity for, and sympathy for the Congress and for me among some people. And some people indeed have been attracted by the BJP's messaging. And if you take a look at the local government, uh, you seem to be softer on the Chief Minister Pinari government than actually your own party colleagues who are quite critical of him and they talk no, anti incumbency. I am strongly critical of the CPM uh, on two or three issues. Number one, their politics of violence. They have been guilty of initiating crude violence against people, both in the streets and in the campuses. And in the campuses, I had this horror story in the constituency just adjoining mine, a place called Nelumagad, practically five minutes away from my constituency. I went and called on a, 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 a father and, and a mother who were brokenhearted because their 20-year-old boy was beaten and tortured to death by the communist-led student union, the SFI. And they, this party has given a license to some of the worst elements in society, goons and thugs, in the name of ideology to conduct extortion, violence, mm -hmm. even murder and rape. And this is something which one has resolutely op uh, opposed. I have appreciated, as I've done with Narendra Modi, certain specific actions of good governance when they have occurred. But I am certainly a strong critic of Mr. Vijayan's government on violence and strong critic of their fiscal mismanagement. We have been plunged into debt. Every child born in Kerala is born with a 14 lakh debt around his neck, and it's just absolutely shocking. On top of that, we have continuing hemorrhage of talent from our state. There's emigration because, A, there are no business opportunities. Businessmen aren't willing to come here because of the Communist Party and its red flags and the demands they make on businesses. And investment is not, is not considered prudent here because of the Communist Party's habit of throwing hartals especially when they're in opposition. So all of these things require a firm hand and a different kind of response. Uh, and, and I must say that it hasn't helped that there are so many corruption allegations against the ruling party here, uh, some of which um, uh, seem to be open and shut cases that the Congress party has also taken up. So I'm with my party on all of these criticisms. You don't want to be the chief minister of the state. You've now uh, uh, 15 years as a member of parliament. Why aren't you moving towards you know, actually becoming a, uh, back Look, to the state. I, I certainly want <laughs> to play my part in defeating this BJP government in the centre and forming a new India Alliance government. Uh, if that doesn't work, many people have been urging me to pay more attention to Kerala politics, where indeed a number of community leaders and political leaders have urged me to think of that. And without my making any effort in Kerala, I'm shocked to find myself leading in a lot of polls mm -hmm. amongst ordinary voters as to who they would like to see in that role. I had not thought about it. My vision in politics has always been national and international. But if uh, the national doors are closed, which I don't think they will be, I really think we're winning this election. But if they are, then of course, uh, the state uh, remains a viable option for any Indian politician. We're I'm no different. Talking about the national scene now, what is your opinion? You, you were at some time criticizing for, pra you know, for praising uh, Prime Minister Modi on some occasions. What is your opinion of the Modi government now and uh, how do you see the national election scene? Look, I think the Modi government has presided over the worst unemployment figures the country has ever seen since figures started being kept in 1938 onwards. And we have got a situation where the worst thing about this is that the educated young are the biggest victims of unemployment. We're 42 percent, as you know, college diploma holding people who are unemployed. In Kerala, 20 to 24 year old people, the people starting jobs, 45.4 percent unemployment. Now this is a recipe for disaster in any society. If the aspirational young who are looking forward to building a future, a career, making a home and so on, they have nothing to look forward to. It's a recipe for despair. This has to be tackled on a war footing. That's one of the biggest failures of the Modi government. Another big failure is the destruction of social harmony. The way in which Indian Muslims have been treated by the Modi government and by their fellow travelers, their party members and, and affiliated parties has been nothing short of a betrayal of the sacred compact of Indian independence, the very cause for which Mahatma Gandhi gave his life. Mm -hmm. So when he died with the words, Hey Ram, on his lips, and the BJP talks of Ram Rajya, it's fair to ask, are you talking about Mahatma Gandhi's Ram Rajya or are you talking about Nathuram Rajya? Is that mm. what you want? Mm. And this is a very, very serious concern that most of us have. Third, I am somewhat worried 
I would say more than somewhat worried about the fact that amidst all of this, the government's financial and economic policies have done so little to benefit the ordinary person in this country. I've read studies that show that the only income growth in 10 years of BJP rule has been in the top 20% of the population. That 80% of Indians have actually witnessed a decline in their income in the last 10 years. Of course, particularly since demonetization, because a lot of these people lived in the cash economy, the, the micro and small enterprises, the chaps you know, who would get some money in the morning to do a piece of work, pay their employers at the end of the day, uh, their employees at the end of the day and collect the payment. Those guys all went out of business with lakhs and lakhs and lakhs of enterprises shutting down outside India. They've not been, I mean, throughout India, they've not been able to revive. Then you've had this real crisis that's facing um, people even in the salaried sector. And now that you've got um, all the other challenges that have come into the economy, uh, including the sad failure of Make in India. I was a supporter of Make in India as an idea. But why, where, what is made in India? What does it produce? In fact, sadly, with the production-linked incentives, what you're doing is you're getting foreign companies taking money from the taxpayers' money from the Indian government to make products in India that are being sold that Indians could have bought cheaper abroad. So I'm not quite sure who, it's, who is benefiting from this and how many workers have actually got jobs as a result. So they have some very, very serious economic failures as well. So on the whole, unemployment, economy, and communal harmony are three very big black marks against this government. Now, and coming to that electoral bonds issue, do you think that is playing a role in this election? Are people aware about this, or that's too esoteric for them to... No, of... I think that when you explain it in terms of corruption, basically you've got two kinds of things that are truly damning. One is, mm -hmm. somebody is raided by the CBI or IT or ED, and, mm -hmm. and shortly thereafter they buy electoral bonds. So that's extortion. Or somebody buys electoral bonds, and shortly thereafter they land a major government contract. That's bribery. Both are forms of corruption, both are disgraceful. So this is all legalized larceny conducted by the government. And that was a great problem. So will that have an impact on the elections? So with educated people, you can explain that this is a, a corrupt government. When they talk about na khaunga na khani dunga, they've been cowering all along. And they've been also khana dunga to their people, their friendly capitalists have given them electoral bonds. That's not a very, very mm. good sign for them as well. Mm. How many? On the subject of money, you also pointed out that your rival uh, has underestimated his assets and uh, to the I haven't pointed to that out, no. no. What have, have you said? When asked by the media, I've said, first of all, I've been too busy from early morning to late night, uh, you know, on these campaign cavalcades waving at people, so I've had no time to even read his affidavit. Secondly, I would much rather, much prefer to actually face him fair and square in an election and beat him rather than have him disqualified because of any mistakes in his affidavit. But having said all that, it's the full democratic right of any national political party to challenge a false affidavit. It would be done to us if we filed a false affidavit. No question about that. And the truth is that in his case, uh, they seem to be full of holes. I don't know what's going to happen. I believe the Congress party nationally is seeing the election commission this afternoon. And complaints have been filed. But coming, because we're talking national, in terms of the Ram Temple, is that going to have any impact, the consecration? And if, if, if not, why? You shook well, your head. First, so. first of all, because... Um, in Kerala, religion is widespread. Trivandrum, by the way, is the Indian city with the largest number of temples per square kilometer of any city in India of any size. So we are not exactly irreligious people. Uh, but we value religion in its own place, and we show respect to all religions around us. So you're saying Ram, the Ram factor will not impact in Kerala? I, I don't think it will impact in the sense that the only controversy was whether mm -hmm. Congress would attend or not. Right. And when Congress said, look, we, we have no... Uh, Problem. Our thing is that why should we go attend a political event where the chief Purohit appears to be the prime minister? I mean, that's not his job. So we'll go. I've said to people, I'm not going to surrender my Ram to the BJP. I don't think BJP has a copyright on Lord Ram. Uh, he is as much mine as he is Mr. Modi's. But I will go on a non-political occasion as a worshipper. I go to temples to pray. I don't go to temples to perform politics, which is what, unfortunately, this particular extravaganza seemed to be all about. Now, finally, in the neighboring uh, Tamil Nadu, there's this huge uh, controversy over Kachatibu Island and the fact that Indira Gandhi, as they say, gave it away and Nehru had uh, dismissed it as a barren uh, rock. And uh, 
Uh, now they're trying to make it an election issue in Tamil Nadu. What is your viewpoint? You've dealt with international affairs. You, uh, you I think it's most unfortunate that the Prime Minister of India mm -hmm. has chosen to make an issue of something that was settled 50 years ago and that was settled in the context of very detailed negotiations right. at the highest levels between the two countries that resolved a number of things at the same time. There was another larger area called the Wadge uh, barrier or reef hotel, which was handed over to India and Kachati was given to them. And we were not occupying Kachatheva, by the way. It was an unoccupied island. Secondly, there was the entire question of the settlement between Indira Gandhi and Srinamabo Bandaranaike of the problem of stateless people of Indian Tamil origin in Sri Lanka who were allowed to migrate to India and find new homes. All of these issues were enmeshed together at a very complicated stage of our relationship between these two countries. And Mr. Karunanathi and the DMK authorities were taken fully into confidence by the central government. So... To make a cheap political issue out of something which at the time was taken very much in the larger interests of the government and people of India as well as the government and people uh, of Tamil Nadu and of, of Sri Lanka and where the fishing rights of the Tamil Nadu fishermen including their right to dry their <laughs> nets on this uninhabited island was explicitly provided for is most unfortunate. It just shows Sadly, uh, I'm sorry to say this, a level of politicization of everything that matters that even my good friend Mr. Jayashankar should be ashamed of. He has been a bureaucrat in the MEA for a long time. I've worked with him. He's a first-rate uh, uh, diplomat. He knows the dangers of reopening the issue. Already there's been a backlash in Sri Lanka. Just read the Sri Lankan media. Go online and see. Why do you provoke the same? That too, Sri Lanka is a, is a country which is being wooed assiduously by the Chinese. You want to give the Chinese a free opening into your, into your, uh, into your own country? They have been, Sri Lanka has the great danger, as the Maldives also represents, of becoming part of a dark, menacing underbelly for us if we, if we allow the Chinese uh, influence to dominate them rather than ours. Why insult them? What do we gain? You think Mr. Modi is going to win seats in Tamil Nadu because of this? I'm sorry, he's really being, to put it bluntly, irresponsible. Finally, last thing. Uh, any new words for this particular <laughs> political Victory discussion? Victory is the only word I have in mind right now. <laughs> well, Shashi Taru, we wish you all the very best Thanks, on your attempt to become the fourth-time MP, or maybe later on look at local leadership if it does happen. No, four, four-time <laughs> MP is the plan. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Having spoken to uh, Shashi Taru, let's now go across to Rajiv Chandrasekhar, who is on his way to a campaign rally and he sat with me in his car and we discussed all the issues including what Shashi Tharoor had to say about him. This is what Rajiv Chandrasekhar has to say. And I'm in the car of Rajiv Chandrasekhar, better known as the Minister of Electronic uh, uh, and Information Technology and for skill, skill Development, the Minister of State, but in a new role, Rajiv, as candidate Rajiv Chandrasekhar for the Lok Sabha constituency of Trivandrum. Rajiv, this is unusual. You've been a Rajya Sabha member, but this is the first time you're actually contesting an election. Why did you make this decision? No, it's a, it, it is certainly the first time I'm contesting uh, for myself a Lok Sabha election, but I've been involved in many, many Lok Sabha elections in the past uh, for friends and colleagues in the party. So the process in itself is not a new one for me. Of course, it is new that I am uh, contesting as a candidate. And uh, uh, way back last year, in August 2023, uh, I was asked if I would like to continue as Raj Sabha or would uh, prefer to go to the Lok Sabha. And I had said then that I would certainly like an opportunity to go to the Lok Sabha and contest in the Lok Sabha and be a people's representative. And uh, the Honorable Prime Minister and Nadaji agreed to my request and uh, here I am. You've lived a lot of your life in uh, my home state, Karnataka, and uh, in fact grew your businesses over there. Why did you choose Kerala? I mean, this is a place, of course, your ancestry belongs to, but you were rarely here. Would you be treated as an outsider in this place? No, look, uh, I was asked in January of this year which constituency I would like to contest and I said uh, straight off the bat that my first choice would be Tiruvanthapuram for many reasons. Kerala is my homeland, my land, my, my motherland, if you want to call it that. And uh, Tiruvanthapuram is the capital of uh, Kerala and so I chose Kerala without uh, much uh, thought and despite the fact that uh, there were some people in the party who said I should choose a safe seat or a safer seat uh, in Bengaluru, etc. But I was clear in my mind that if the Prime Minister agreed and uh, Nadaji agreed, 
that my first choice would be Tiruvandurum and if they for some reason said no to it then I would of course explore other opportunities but uh, and the reason I say that is because there was a lot of speculation at that time that Mr. Jai Shankar and Nirmala Sitaramanji would be possible candidates for uh, Tiruvandurum. So when I said in January that I would consider it an honor and a privilege to contest in Tiruvandurum, in the backdrop was this reportage and conversation by a lot of people that there were other senior leaders also who were possible uh, candidates for this uh, uh, great constituency of Tiruvandurum. So I said it in January and then in February, uh, towards the end of February, early March, I was told that my request had been exceeded to, and so, like I said before, here I am. Well, this is really seen as, uh, if you can call it now, the India bastion, or the Indian Alliance uh, bastion, and the fact that uh, though the BJP does pretty well, in terms of seats, it's really not scored too high. Um, rarely does it win, uh, except possibly in the Assembly. Uh, now, how do you see this fight? Because you have a three-time MP, Shashi Tharoor, and... Uh, He's been around for a while. How, what are the key issues you feel are in this constituency? No, I, I think the, uh, the, uh, the answer is there in a question that uh, people have been around for a while in this constituency. Uh, very little has happened in the constituency despite people being around for long periods of time. People have given mandates repeatedly to, uh, to members of parliament and state governments and there's very little to show for it. Tiruvanthuram, Kerala, in, Kerala as a state, as you know recently in the Supreme Court, is one of the most financially mismanaged states in the country. <coughs> they are having to borrow today to pay off uh, loans, pay off sorry salaries and pensions of their own employees. So it is a mismanaged state, chronically mismanaged state, and uh, it, there has been a very sort of a lazy politics to, here, where people don't have to really do anything; they get by by fear mongering <coughs> excuse me fear mongering and peddling uh, the kind of uh, lies that uh, that uh, scare off minorities so i think the difference in this this time around is that a narendra modi ji's 10 years uh, of governance and how he has transformed india is in full display and full view for people to compare it with the earlier 10 years of the congress and the 8 years of the communist party in kerala so the three fronts, if you want to call it that, and their performance, their governance performance, their economic performance, their performance to improve the lives of people are uh, available in sharp contrast uh, uh, to what Narendra Modi ji has done. So I think this is a very different election in the sense that people are now saying who is best suited to build a better future for us, who is best suited to deliver this future of development and progress and prosperity for us who is, is going to be better suited or better equipped or better trusted to build a better future for our children so those are questions that are increasingly now becoming mainstream it was not the case 10 years ago <coughs> because people never saw an alternative to uh, between bad and worse I think now they see an alternative to bad and very bad which is good and uh, I humbly submit that uh, the last 10 years of Narendra Modi ji is a clear signal for all political parties to up their game and uh, move away from the old 65 years of narrative of false promises or promises that they never keep. I asked Shashitaru this question about his non-performance as you had put it and he said uh, he of course gave a whole, a whole list of his performance and then turned around and said well uh, when I asked about you, he said Raju Chandrasekhar is a performer, not a performance. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to get into it. He's demonstrated in the last few days that uh, I had a little bit of respect for him as I came into the contest. Uh, after what he has done in the last few days, peddling lies about CAA and then uh, stooping to get SDPI support and more recently making wild allegations of bribing for votes, etc., etc., uh, I think he's uh, certainly not the man I thought he was and I certainly don't want to go stoop to his level of uh, politicking. It's a fact today. <coughs> I don't have to say it and it's certainly not my saying that will make people believe. Uh, it is the people's widespread acknowledgement of the fact that the last 15 years he has done very little. He has made a lot of big, big promises including uh, a promise that he should have never made, but uh, he, he made that he would trans transform Tirundurum into Barcelona and uh, many, many of those kinds of promises that he obviously never intended to keep. 
uh, he made them in the classic Congress fashion to win elections and then uh, forget about it. So, look, him and me are certainly very different people. His uh, assessment of what performance is and what he considers performance is very different from what I consider performance. I have an 18-year track record of delivering. I have built things in my life. I have, uh, uh, I have created value, created jobs, made in, created investment. I have uh, led, by my own token, a blemish-free <coughs> uh, public life, public career of 18 years. And I have uh, uh, done uh, reasonably well as a minister in Narendra Modiji's government and contributed to the growth of the digital economy and the innovation ecosystem and the skill ecosystem. In the country. So I know what I have done. People know what I have done. Certainly, uh, I think people of Trivandrum, Tiruvandavaram, are certainly searching for what uh, Mr. Tarur has done and if he can help them, uh, good, more power to him. Now, the RSS has a very strong base here. I mean, traditionally has been that. Is uh, the Ram Temple, Hindutva, uh, would there be issues? Uh, would there be any benefit uh, being, you know, an awareness in terms of the fact the consecration has happened and would that have uh, uh, come into play? I don't think so. The campaign for me from day one till today has been a campaign that is based on really what people are aspiring to get in their lives, which is uh, development, it is about investments, it's about jobs, it's about skilling, it's about progress, and uh, and that cuts across all communities. So I think our campaign has been about what the last 10 years of Prime Minister Narendra Modiji's government has been, which is about progress and development, <coughs> sabka vikas and sabka saath, which is progress and development for all all people uh, of India and all people of Tiruvandavaram and all people of Kerala. So that is the crux of our campaign. Uh, and uh, the, the, the ironical fact is that while we are talking about this and talking about new ideas of taking Tiruvandavaram and Kerala forward, the Indi Alliance uh, partners, the two partners of the Indi Alliance who purport to be opponents are stuck in the same old record of fear mongering and uh, saying lies about the CAA and beef eating and all things that are should have gone out of fashion many many decades ago but these people continue to cling to. Now one of the things that the uh, Chief Minister said last year when you had raised the Kalamashari blast and he said uh, uh, Rajiv Chandrasekhar is uh, he actually used the words poison and venom uh, now how do you uh, juxtapose that with what you're saying that you're focusing on development but he says you're communal in your approach yeah i mean uh, certainly uh, somebody from a marxist ideology is not the last word on uh, on uh, peace and non violence so certainly i will not rank uh, pindra vijayan's comments about me uh, terribly i uh, give it too much of credence or credibility he will say what he has to say uh, people uh, will discard what he has to say and he certainly i told him extremely angrily after he said that that you can call me many things but the moment you call me Vargyavadi or uh, communal, then you need to get your head examined. Yeah. So I said it bluntly to him and he, he knows that it is a foolish thing to say of me, uh, knowing my background and knowing my, uh, my record. So that, that, you know, he went into silence mode uh, very shortly after that. So these are things in politics that people often say in anger and, you know, they lash out because they know they're on a thin ice. Uh, the issue that I was raising was the free pass he had given to the Hamas to come here and radicalize our youth at a time when uh, we had all, the whole world had seen what had happened on October 7th and uh, he didn't have a fig leaf uh, to cover that act. He did not even bother to apologize for it and tried to brazen his way out by saying freedom of speech and, and so on and so forth. So that is when I outed him and he got obviously angry about it because it, that that was that was an embarrassing outing of a chief minister and a home minister. He is also a home minister who sworn uh, who swears uh, who sworn by the constitution to uphold law and order in the in the state of Kerala. So he he reacted as he reacted and uh, predictably after I responded he kept quiet. Now uh, there has been also a recent controversy in the fact that Doordarshan is uh, planning to play out uh, the Kerala story, the uh, the film, and uh, Pinari Vijayan, the chief minister, said it shouldn't be done. What is your view on that? Is that a lot of this is lot of this is uh, election type, uh, uh, you know, r running to the bottom of the barrel in terms of appeasing? I think nobody really. Whether it's Pindrai Vijayan or uh, Shashi Tarur or uh, the Congress, the local Congress president, 
really uh, cares much about what happens in uh, Kashmir. Uh, they don't care about what happens next door to people. They don't care about the suffering of people. But certainly election time, they all make this mad, uh, very obvious and shameless kind of a competition to get the Muslim vote. And for that, they will say or do anything. And even uh, many Muslims that I have met are embarrassed by this uh, show of brazen appeasement that um, is really cringeworthy, uh, according to me. But you think it's okay to have the film screened at this time? That's not playing politics, sir. Uh, it's, it's a film that's been certified by the CBFC. It has been released elsewhere, and I don't see why it can't be released or, or aired. I don't understand what, what the... If somebody is d uncomfortable with the storyline, that doesn't mean that the rest of the country can't see it. If, so, if the movie or a story exposes uh, some part of a history that people find uncomfortable, that certainly is no uh, no excuse or in, indeed and no logical explanation for saying no 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 I don't want to see it because it embarrasses me and 50 years of uh, how we mishandled Kashmir and how many people died as a consequence. I think a story has been uh, put out there. It has been certified by the censors, and uh, you know last time I checked Article 19, guaranteed uh, freedom of expression which the left likes to jump onto every time as long as it uh, suits them. And when it doesn't suit them, uh, Article 19 just vanishes for them. So uh, I think that's, uh, we will leave it at that. Now, Kerala has got, uh, you know, a really good mix of religious uh, identities. Uh, you know, the almost equal population of uh, Christians and Muslims as well as, of course, Hindus uh, uh, are there. In terms of the Muslim vote, are you confident of getting some of those votes or you think that is now... Look, Raj, I have crisscrossed this constituency and I've met every community, every person, uh, gender-wise, social caste-wise, religion-wise. <coughs> and I can tell you the, the, the what people want, what whether you are a Muslim or a Christian or a Hindu or anybody or lingu a linguistic minority in, uh, in Kerala, the needs and the ask from a public representative remains the same. You want opportunities, you want public services that are given to you, you want to be able to have a government or a mem member of parliament make a difference in your life. And it doesn't matter if you're a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian. And that is why I don't have a different campaign, uh, unlike the Congress uh, for when I go into a Muslim house and a different campaign when I go into a Hindu house and a different campaign when I go to a Christian house. It is the same thing that I say or do and promise to a, any home that I, I, I visit and any constituent that I visit. So this is a very Congress um, sort of a psyche or a mentality or a game plan, which is that you are different things to different people. We are one thing, the same consistent thing of progress and development to all people of Tirundoram. How do you react to the fact that uh, given what happened in Manipur and the incidents in the Christians field in secure year and in fact informally the church apparently is saying not to vote for you all. What is your sense of uh, that particular issue? I don't know where you got that information from Raj so I, I would suggest that you don't uh, uh, subscribe to gossip columns to come to conclusions like that. Nobody has said any, anything of that sort. No church has said that. I have uh, visited every church, I have visited uh, m more Christian families than uh, most candidates have and I don't hear any of those uh, Delhi-based conspiracy theories here. Uh, so that is absolutely incorrect. Second is, of course, I think uh, without a doubt, people have planted the poison uh, of using misinformation or less than accurate facts about what happened in Manipur. It is something that I have taken a lot of effort to explain to community leaders, community representatives about what really is Manipur. It is really about ethnic conflict. It's deep-rooted ethnic uh, violence and hostility that has uh, that predates the BJP, predates Narendra Modi ji, and it's been going on for years and decades. And therefore, we are today in, in a lot of ways trying to fix a problem that has a legacy problem, including the issue of open borders and therefore illegal migration. So, uh, you know, if somebody is reasonable and wants to really understand what the problem is, they, they, they get it. If somebody wants to use that to spread poison because they want to harvest the consequences of the poison electorally, then they will say what they have to say. But increasingly, Christians are rejecting that poison. They understand very f well that these people who are peddling these lies have now been so badly discredited that the lies no longer uh, have the currency or the traction that they once used to have.
Now you've been in business now. How do you see the correlation between business and politics? And you know, does that make you more efficient? What is the what are the lessons you learn from management that you can bring into I politics? Know, I don't know what you mean by saying I'm in business. I left business in 2006. I, I said entered you've been in business. Business, in, of course. Being yes. a being an entrepreneur, uh, being uh, being uh, a techie uh, for many many years certainly gives you a deeper understanding of. Uh, how, what makes an economy tick, what causes jobs to be created, what makes investments happen. Uh, because finally, at the end of the day, the most important issue for everybody is livelihoods, jobs, a decent way of living, improving standards of living, improving per capita income. Those are the goals that a government aspires to live up to and to deliver to its people. So, yes, of course, being an entrepreneur, being an investor, having gone through the mill of building companies, creating jobs, creating investment <coughs> does help when you come to a city like Tiruvanthapuram, know fully how uh, how poorly the economy is, uh, is really growing, how despite all of its potential for many, many years, the potential has not been harnessed and that there is really a lack of political vision in Tiruvanthapuram and Kerala that is holding Kerala back. It is, it, it is deeply embarrassing for a state that is a proud state of Kerala to be told by the Supreme Court that look, uh, your government is essentially mismanaging your economy and you are today borrowing to pay pensions and salaries. Uh, uh, was there no economy before 2016 in, in the state of Kerala? It was. There was a robust economy. Uh, there were no problems in paying salaries and pensions before 2016. So uh, these are the things that uh, being uh, in entrepreneur teaches you. But more than any of that, the last 18 years in public life has taught me the real uh, lessons that need to be learned by a public servant, which is really that at the end of the day, what you get respected for <coughs> by the people is your dedication, your ability to solve their problems, and really your sincerity in serving them. And uh, it is finally at the end of the day about serving people. Any which way you spin it, uh, you can be sophisticated, you can be a global citizen, you can be the highest, your greatest intellectual. None of that matters when it comes to the final report card by the people of the state or the city or the constituency you represent, which is, have you served them? Have you done them a, a good turn in their lives? Have you done anything by which they feel grateful for your service? And if you haven't done that, then the rest of it is all spin and propaganda. And you said you had given up all your business. So one of the things was the asset declaration that you'd done to Election Commission. Apparently, you're worth what, much, much more. There was a lot of insinuations on this. What is your explanation on that front? It is, a, it is, it is, a, it is. A, as I said, it's a, a election season, so people have to say what they have to say. It is the same disclosure I've been making for 18 years. It is vetted by the lawyers. It is absolutely accurate and represents what my assets are. Uh, if people want to speculate on. Uh, uh, I have hidden assets and so on and so forth. I always welcome them to go to court and uh, you know do whatever is under law possible. So I will not get into this game where you you know drag me away from my core objective of talking of development, progress, jobs, and opportunity uh, by distracting me and dragging me into a slanging match about something that you make up. The Congress has tried this many times before and have many times been unsuccessful. So, uh, good luck to them this time. Finally, your views on the fact the Congress, uh, uh, you know, is putting up Rahul Gandhi, is putting uh, this thing. What is your sense of the way the Congress uh, will, do you think Rahul Gandhi should be standing from here? What is your thoughts on this? I mean, I think if Rahul Gandhi stands in Amethi, which I understand now he's going to stand, he's doing a deadly disservice to the people of Kerala. The Kerala people, he spun this yarn that he's coming to improve the lot of the people of Vainar. The Vain people of Vainar have not seen any sort of improvement in their life in the last uh, uh, five years that he's been an MP. And now midstream to dump them and abandon them and go to Amethi is certainly a travesty, in my opinion, and a deep injustice to the people of uh, Kerala. And why not? Finally, uh, Rajiv, what is your you know, uh, message that you would like to give? What is the... The, the future of uh, Indian politics is what we have seen in the last 10 years. It's about taking India forward. It is to really our goal, collective mission to make India a developed nation. And therefore, no amount of distraction and no, none of the politics of division should come in the way of us all working together to get to where India should be uh, as the third largest economy in the world and a developed nation by 2047. Rajiv Chandrasekhar, thank you very much. You. Wish you all the very best. Thank, thank you. you. So there you have it. You've heard Shashi Tharoor, you've heard Rajiv Chandrasekhar. 
in one of the biggest electoral battles of 2024. This is the bastion of the India Alliance. The BJP is trying to breach it. Rajiv Chandrasekhar has many senses, the fulcrum of that strategy. And Shashi Tharoor is the bastion that has to defend not only the Congress legacy, but the India legacy. You can see how hot campaigning is right behind me. All their posters, not just Rajiv Chandrasekhar, the left candidate, as well as Shashi Tharoor in the distance. That is Kerala. That is to Andrew. This is how elections are fought. And the outcome, of course, is uh, the uh, first, the, uh, Kerala goes to the polls very quickly, but still there's a week and a half to go. How that turns out will depend on what the voters think. Anything can happen in the next couple of weeks. But till then, thank you for being on this episode of Nothing But The Truth. I look forward to having you with me next week. Nothing But The Truth. 